Good morning and a very warm welcome to the Sustainable Business Network. This morning's session is on a very topical issue of net zero and pleased to say this isn't an election free zone so we can concentrate on the content that we need to cover here. We're looking at our agenda today, delighted to have uh, three excellent speakers for you. We have Zoe Booth from uh, Carbon Footprint, who will be taking on the main topic for today. There's Zoe, <laughs> good to see you. We've also got uh, Peter Sharman and Sean Robinson from Mulally, who are going to be presenting a fascinating case study of uh, the journey that Mulally has made since uh, 2012, in fact. We're going to have a panel discussion at the end, and what I should say is for questions, we'll take those after the individual speakers. What we will do, if there are questions that we feel cover everyone's presentation, we'll save those to the panel session. Before we get started any further, we have a question for you. We have a poll, so please do pull out your smartphones and we are asking the question, where are you on your net zero journey? I'll give you a little time just to pull your phones out. Uh, what I should say is that the poll is completely anonymous. We are going to be doing the analysis on the fly there and I think First, we'll start with a very, very brief legislation and market trend update. And um, you can see this is actually a different QR code on here. Why am I showing this? It is a feedback form. Yes, it's the beginning of the meeting. This is up here, though, because we do want to know what topics do you'd like us to cover in these sessions. And indeed, if you'd like to give a presentation at them. So please. what's been happening recently? Well, a few noteworthy things. Um, first over on the left there is IC. The, this is the Integrity Council for Voluntary Carbon uh, Markets, ICVCM. And these guys have approved the first set of carbon offsets. You might say, well, there are lots of certifications out there. Yes, that's true. And the ICVCM was originally set up by Mark Carney, as you might remember, as the uh, head of the Bank of England um, a few years ago. And he set this up so that we can easily compare the different types of carbon offset standards that are in the marketplace, which should include things like VCS, gold standard, etc. So the news here is that the first set of um, credits have now been approved under IC VCM and they're called uh, they follow the core carbon principles of CCP and you'll start seeing this little sort of purple and white logo appearing um, all over. Early credits include um, landfill gas refrigerant uh, type related offsets. Um, they're not the biggest of of programs. The big ones, of course, are renewables and um, such like, and they're coming very, very soon through that process. Obviously, those are huge projects. We are expecting those to pass and get the IC logo any day. Um, so that's happened. Other things that are newsworthy, water. Yes, water has been a bit of a problem, mostly because of the age of the infrastructure that we have in this country. It's not for me to delve into the politics of that, but that's been causing problems and we've been reverting to using bottled water, which is never a good thing. And um, as our minds turn to all things sports, there's been some warnings about the Olympics in Paris and Olympians being uh, faced with challenges due, due to climate change and increased temperatures affecting the games. So just really a statement of our times about what's happening with those increase in temperatures. Of course, I'm going to mention ESOS. I know a good number of you have hopefully finished this now or in the very, very late stages. We have now passed the extension date that was earlier this month. Um, what actually happened during that time is the ESOS portal, known as the MESOS, did go down and did give some problems for people trying to register. Um, I actually wrote a letter to the EA to let them know about it. And what they have said, and I do have it in writing, is for anyone who um, 
was trying to make their submissions, was trying to get their registration in, so long as they get everything done by the 5th of August, then it's fine. Um, originally, they were saying that you had to be registered um, by that June date, but there were some IT problems. So long as you've got some documentation showing that you made an effort for that, that's going to be absolutely fine. ESOS doesn't end there, though. The next step for you is going to be the ESOS action plan that is due in December. And then the actions to update that come on an annual basis. We always talk about fines and unfortunately, we quite frequently talk about fines to water companies and uh, this session session is no different from that. We can see Welsh water there getting into trouble for polluting the river. Why? Um, I mean, they, those fines there aren't actually that big. And if I were being critical, I might say, does that actually act as a big enough disincentive to change behaviours? And we can all read there what has been said by the um, by the EA about the behaviour. Anglian Water as well got convicted by the EA for the activities there. Fines for other others but no cost deal sentences. So maybe these are a little weak, weak as well. Um, here we have uh, a transgression associated with the Rossborough Golf Club. I actually grew up very near to this region. And here, unfortunately, we're seeing 700 lorry loads of waste being dumped illegally, which is not really not good. And um, a sizable fine for those organizations there. We've got as well individuals being fined there for um, for illegally storing waste. Things are happening, whether it's a little bit slow at the EA at the moment, you, you decide those are the updates on um, who's being fined at the moment. For further reading, there are some links here. Obviously, these will be clickable in the um, in the slide pack that appears on YouTube. So please do have a look at that for further reference great okay um that little little tour round of what's happening out there most of the activity now including the news updates on net zero will be covered by zoe booth over to you zoe thanks Cindy. <clears throat> hopefully you can all see my screen just pop this out the way um so um, we're going to be talking about uh, net zero, as you hopefully all know, um, and the reason that you're here and what it is, uh, why we should be interested in it and how you can achieve it. So if I just on this slide, I've just um, popped here a few terms that you might have heard on your journey, whether you're right at the beginning of it um, or whether you've been doing it for quite a few years now. Uh, these all do have slightly different meanings uh, and these terms have evolved over time, uh, which can be a little bit confusing sometimes because you might have heard, heard them being used interchangeably. Um, you'll see that kind of carbon neutral and net zero are on there and those are the, the most common ones that you'll likely have heard of. Um, and we will cover these in a little bit more detail today, um, but they generally involve greenhouse gas reductions and some form of neutralization or offsetting. Um, and then you have other terms being kind of climate positive, carbon negative, uh, the beyond carbon neutral, carbon neutral plus and there, which tend to mean something a little bit more, which is going above and beyond that kind of net zero carbon neutral goal um, and leading to kind of creating a positive impact rather than just avoiding negative ones. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to talk mostly today about net zero, but I will touch on carbon neutral here a little bit as well, because these are the two most common terms that you'll have likely heard. Um, they are different and we will run through these now. Um, <coughs> You can he see here a couple of different definitions. Um, these are quite commonly used ones and they're from kind of reputable um, pathways for defining carbon neutral. Um, so we've got here the BSI PAS 2060 carbon neutrality. This is something that um, quite a few of you might have heard of or even taken part in. 
And you've also got the much newer ISO 14068 part one, which is also on carbon neutrality that came out at the end of last year. So much newer. And some of you may or may not have heard of that so far. The wording here is very similar. I'm not going to read it out to you because you can all kind of see it there. But the key wording difference here is kind of the no net increase in the BSI PES 2060 and the reduction term in the ISO. This is really a formality of the wording, though uh, some of you who have done PES 2060 will know that it does require a, a reduction anyway, and it does also require offsetting in, and you will have seen that in kind of your QAS forms and carbon reduction plans that you will have had to do for that. The ISO will actually be replacing the PES 2060, and BSI have said that they're actually not going to be uh, assessing for PAS 2060 after the 1st of January 2025. So the carbon neutral definition from the ISO will be the one that they kind of align with going forwards. And the enhancement on the wording there is definitely welcome. On to net zero, we have a couple of different definitions here again. One from the ISO and one from Science Based Targets Initiative as well. A lot of you will have heard of this organization anyway, whether you're part of their pathways or not. Um, they actually draw their definition from the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And these are very similar again, but the ISO is more specific on the balance of residual emissions. Uh, again, this is a technicality of the wording as SBTI does also require this. And they both do agree, as you can see there at the bottom of the screen, that, that they should be offsetting residual emissions only. Uh, so just a little bit here about what residual emissions means um, for those of you who haven't heard it. There are a couple of definitions here again. Um, they are very similar, but slightly different wording. The key theme here is that there's a focus on reducing your emissions as much as possible before relying on offsets or neutralization, um, whichever term you are using, uh, before you can actually achieve a claim of net zero. This differs from the ISO 14068 carbon neutrality. This is the diagram here from their standard. Uh, and this does mention residual emissions and they recognize those. And the key thing for them is that they would also like you to reduce down to residual in the long term, but they do actually allow you to claim carbon neutral on the way to that that kind of um, end goal there. So you'll see here as well that they do allow any kind of carbon credit in the early stages of your journey to be used, whereas um, the SBTI and net zero guidelines from ISO actually specify that you should be using removal credits. These do move uh, towards removal credits here as well for the carbon neutral pathway. Um, but as I say, you can use anything in your earlier stages whilst you're reducing to the residual level. The key point here is that the carbon neutral claim can be made much sooner than a net zero claim could be in most cases. And it can also be uh, argued sometimes that the residual greenhouse gas emissions that you'll see there could be a little bit of a moving goalpost um, as we see technological advancements moving forward. The Science Based Targets Initiative does kind of acknowledge this in their guidance um, with a, their main goal being to hit a 90% reduction for most organisations. Uh, this isn't so clear in the ISO IWA, which is um, the net zero guidelines just based on the wording, it's not quite so clear. Um, that's not actually currently a standard in its own right though, um, but we will hopefully see that, that movement forward uh, with clarifications there in the future. Um, but one benefit of the ISO carbon neutrality that you see here is that it ensures that positive changes are still being made globally throughout um, with reduction credits on the journey to get to those residual emissions there. 
I've just got a little bit here as well about um, the difference between the reductions and removals with those two, uh, well, with the SBTI pathway and the net zero guidelines from ISO there. So you can see here that currently they are both uh, removal only, but it should be noted that the Science-Based Targets Initiative is reviewing their stance on this. And you might have seen news on them looking at these EACs, um, which are Environmental Attribute Certificates. Uh, this does include, but is not limited to, the voluntary carbon markets credits. So we may see those becoming available for this pathway in the future, which is welcomed by the ICVCM. I've also popped in here the Beyond Value Chain Mitigation or BVCM. Uh, this is going above and beyond the standard science-based targets from the SBTI program and actually calls for action and investment outside of your value chain. Uh, this includes avoidance, removal and storage of greenhouse gases to enhance the long-term value uh, of your pathway there. And this can include things like in more technology based solutions such as direct air capture. So all things to consider there for your journey. So one of the questions that you might be asking is why why net zero? Why do we keep hearing about it so much in the news? Um, I'm just going to touch quickly touch on this and not go into too much detail but I've popped the uh, name there at the bottom from the Stockholm Resilience Centre if you'd like to look at this and we can also share the link on the slide pack as well. Um, some of you might have seen this image before and it's the planetary boundaries so this is a, an update from 2023 um, and you can see here that we have now transgressed six of the nine kind of safe operating spaces spaces as they call them and this includes for climate change uh, with co2 emissions being in there as well so whilst it's not the only kind of area of concern environmentally uh, it is one of the key ones up there and we'll be focusing on that today of course in terms of how we got here this is not an exhausted uh, list, but some notable mentions here. So we have the Climate Change Act, uh, which was actually put in place in 2008, which set out the UK to make an 80% reduction um, to 2050 from a 1990 base year. A lot of people think that the Paris Agreement uh, in 2015 was kind of the key area in this movement, and it was a big piece there and it was the first kind of legally binding international treaty on climate change and we saw I think it was 196 parties at the COP21 sign up for this but you can see here that actually we did have legislation in place on this pathway before we even got to the 2015 Paris Agreement there. And we also had the PAS 2060 come into place in 2010 when it was first published so it was already in people's minds back then. Um, we then had an update to the, the Climate Change Act in 2019, which just changed that 80% to 100%, which is where we really see that term kind of net zero coming into play in legislation in the UK. And then that's followed uh, soon after by the SBTI launching their first net zero corporate standard in 2021, um, along with the net zero guidelines coming out in 2022 and you'll see the ISO on there as well for the carbon neutral. Um, I've put the carbon neutral in there because it it still kind of uses similar principles to the net zero and I think it's handy to show. You can see from this that the UK targets this climate change act that you'll see um, is a driver for business change this is often a two-way street so you know businesses can drive the government changes as well um, but in this case we can see it the other way around um, so I've just popped in the target there from the actual legislation but you'll be more likely familiar with some of the other legislation pieces that support this. So you've got your ESOS, SECA and the PPN, which some of you may have to comply with or be looking at soon. 
And you may also be interested in this due to tenders and stakeholders driving you for this. So you may be being asked by your customers to submit to platforms such as CDP, EcoVardis or other platforms. In terms of kind of why doing it for your business, um, there are a number of climate risks. You'll have seen increased uh, flooding, temperatures and various other things as well. And mitigating this is, is all part of the journey there. Um, <clears throat> of course, there are also cost benefit analysis to be done on various different things. And there are different payback periods for any of you who will have taken part in ESOS. You'll have seen those come into play um, within your reporting, hopefully. And you can start making decisions based on those payback periods as well. And lastly, it's important to stay competitive in your market. Obviously, we all like to look at this uh, from an environmental perspective and, and how great it is for the environment. Um, but the reality is, as a business as well, is that if you're not doing it, your competitors will be. Um, so it's important to stay ahead of the trends there as well. Now we're just going to touch on a little bit of the how you can get started with this. This imaging is from uh, Carbon Footprint, but you can generally follow this process yourself anyway. The key aims here are obviously to measure your footprint. Um, if you're not measuring it, it's incredibly difficult for you to then make a realistic target to reduce um, and you have nothing to reduce against. So it's really important that you set yourselves up here with a good base year and cover everything that you should be covering to make sure that um, that's all in scope. You can then set your target once you've got that information um, and ideally you would then be reducing year on year or something similar to that effect. Um, and then you have obviously a choice here to offset uh, once you're reaching that residual emissions zone or along the pathway as you'll have seen with the carbon neutral ISO there. To measure your emissions, there are a number of different methodologies that you should really be considering. Uh, one of the most widely accepted um, ones that you'll see here is the greenhouse gas protocol. It's accepted as best practice for most corporate organisations. Uh, there are updates to come to this. The last version of it was quite a while ago now, uh, but these are slightly delayed. So we're expecting these to come out in 2025 rather than the, the original date of 2024, which we saw. Um, but hopefully these will be a little bit more robust with more examples of application, which is where some of the grey areas come from at the moment. Uh, for those of you who have looked into this, you'll you'll know what I mean there. Um, in the meantime, we do also have a number of supporting guidance documents, some of which are linked on the Greenhouse Gas Protocol website, but we will also see these come through from the Science-Based Targets Initiative. And examples of that are the flag um, sector guidance there, as well as the finance and power sector guidance, along with others. And you'll also see other organisations as well. So we've got PCAF here, which is uh, for financials, and also the UK GBC, which is the Green Building Council, looking more at the kind of construction building side there. So once you've had a kind of consideration of what those are, you will obviously want to start assessing your footprint. And you can do this in-house and there are a number of fantastic free tools that you can use here. Uh, they do vary in quality a little bit and whatever you use, just make sure that you check the platform or calculator is audited by a third party so that you're getting the quality that you, you need. And also it's not a bad idea to consider getting your own assessment verified by a third party as well, just for that additional credibility. Um, you don't have to, but it is best practice. And if you are struggling a little bit more or just feel you need some additional support there, you can also consider the route of consultant led assessments there too. Once you have your assessment, as we mentioned, you can start thinking about setting your target. So, so we do have a white paper link here just on how to do the maths for target setting. So please do take a look at that in your free time because um, it is quite useful. And we've, we've got then here uh, 
kind of some of the things that you should be thinking about when you're actually setting this target. So you want to be looking at what is actually feasible for you as, as an organization. We see so often that companies are setting targets with a deadline in mind, um, but don't actually have any idea of how to get there. So it is a good idea to be thinking about this as you set the target itself. And that can involve looking at the easy wins I've turned here. So thinking about timelines on lease renewals for your buildings and vehicles and also contract renewable um, renewals with any of your suppliers as well. So all things that are important in that journey. We've also then got here just a little bit about how ambitious you should be in your targets. Uh, some of you might be a little bit cautious about publishing ambitious targets and that is understandable. Um, you can however have ambitious internal targets and you can publish something a little bit more conservative externally. It is about finding the balance to make sure that you are being realistic with your targets but also staying competitive within your market and where that sits is going to be something that's defined by your business and the market sector that you sit in. It is worth making sure that you continually review your targets if you can see that you are progressing and you're well ahead of where you wanted to be then perhaps you go ahead and then publish that uh, external ambitious target that you'd originally set internally um, because that will really drive change in your market as well. And it's important to remember to revisit your targets and assessment scope if that changes. So, for example, if you acquire a company or divest, uh, that might change the scope of your base year. So just a note on that. And there is some guidance within the greenhouse gas protocol guidelines on that as well. Once you have your targets, you can think about really making the reductions here. It's important not to forget about passive reductions. So many of you will be thinking actively about what you can do, and that's great. And we encourage that. Um, but there will also be changes that happen around you. So movements towards renewable grids, and this will vary by country. Um, but particularly in the UK, you'll see that happening around the 2035 mark. And you'll see as well that emission factors move forward with that as well as the grid decarbonizes. So where you are using uh, emission factors for your supply chain, you'll also see those emissions naturally drop, providing that the, the country they are within uh, is also moving towards a renewable grid. And we've got here as well uh, some other changes that you might be considering making. So things like behavioural changes, uh, turning off heating lights, example. Um, so this is great stuff and it can be assisted by technology as well. So you might install sensors for your lighting or enhance your BMS system for the heating, for example. Um, and you've also got some other swaps in here as well. So an example would be material swaps in construction and manufacturing, uh, some of which you might have seen in the news recently. I think just last month uh, there was a big piece on recycled cement and how game changing that could actually be for the industry. So these are really exciting things to, to keep ahead of and keep your eye on as well as you move forward in your journey. We've got a little bit here about offsetting and neutralising as well. You can kind of use these terms interchangeably uh, depending on which pathway you're looking at. The key thing here, regardless of when you decide to use this as part of your journey, as you follow the kind of traditional net zero pathway and do this once you've hit residual or whether you do this along the journey, um, is to make sure that you are doing your due diligence and you are actually checking that the offsets are from an accredited source, whether they are removal or reduction. And we've linked here the carbon, uh, the core carbon principles, which come from the ICVCM. Here we have an example of a carbon, carbon credit rating system. So this is made by Carbon Footprint Limited. This is an example of the things that you should be checking or making sure that they are rated on. So we've got here additionality, permanence, measurability, leakage, and also these ones are scored based on their rating from the ICVCM CCP submissions. So you'll see higher overall scores if those have been accepted through that programme. 
I've popped the link in here. This is free to use. Please do take a look. Just a little look here at some of the certification routes for net zero. So we've mentioned the ISO net zero guidelines within this, um, but they're not actually uh, part of the standards yet. So this is uh, kind of not really yet there yet from the ISO on the net zero uh, certification. But we do have the SBTI validation route that you will have seen. And <clears throat> you can also see here a list of complementary routes. These won't gain you a net zero certification, but they do help along the journey. And you might find that it's worthwhile you looking at this for your own suppliers, or you may already be submitting for your customers, for example. And these reporting platforms that you see here can really help push the supply chain and create faster progression. I've just popped in here as well, um, the Caddy there um, being a free resource that you can take a look at um, for carbon disclosure as well. So what does a pathway to net zero look like for you? Um, this could be bringing together the net zero and carbon neutral um, they are different, but they can complement one another. So you'll have seen, as I mentioned, that the carbon neutral ISO is very similar to the net zero uh, pathway from SBTI with slight differences on the offsetting, really. So it is up to you which pathway you choose to, to pick, but they can complement each other. So it's worth bearing both in mind as you make that decision. Um, as you could be claiming carbon neutral on your pathway to net zero um, and just showcasing there the extra steps that you're taking to make positive impacts on the environment as well. The key thing to remember is to follow the hierarchy. So we really do want you to be reducing your emissions and offsetting what's left rather. The carbon neutral pathway can be a useful tool in achieving the net zero. Um, and you can use both to define your boundaries and um, carry out gap analysis to determine what needs to go into your base year before you start setting your targets uh, and really creating reduction plans there. And there are complementary elements of, of all of these standards that we've talked about today. So if we take PAS 2060, for example, uh, one that is going to be phased out very soon, but one of the key things that came out of that was having an annual review of a carbon reduction plan. And that's something that can be really helpful for businesses uh, in getting to their net zero target. This is already kind of recognized in industry having a combined pathway. And you'll see uh, recently that BSI did release a net zero pathway scheme. This isn't technically a standard. It's not released by the ISO or anything, but it brings together elements of the 14,064 part one, which is the ISO for measurement of your footprint, along with the net zero guidelines. Uh, and that will be audited in kind of three year cycles, as with many of their other standards. And it will be audited against the net zero guidelines uh, and the reporting principles even though that those net zero guidelines are not yet a standard. So they've recognized that there's a little bit of a gap there and have created this pathway. Um, so yeah. <laughs> where, where you are in your carbon reduction journey. So we can see that uh, most of you here have said that you're measuring your footprint, um, but perhaps not so many of you are setting targets or have set targets yet um, or offsetting. So that's interesting to see that a lot of you are doing that first step, but might not have taken the plunge uh, in, in moving forward from there, really. Hopefully, this presentation that you'll have seen today will give you a little bit more information about how to do that and where to go from the measuring stage. Um, just looking at the key challenges here. So for the measurement of the footprint, the key one here that we can see is obviously a lack of resource. This is something that we do hear quite a lot as consultants on this end of carbon footprint. Um, and really, we want to see in the future and, and are seeing currently a movement towards much easier ways of doing this. So some of you may be using or have heard of um, software platforms that you can use. Um, and hopefully in the future, those will be 
um, kind of pulling all of your data for you using APIs and, and things like that. So we do hope that as we go forward, these things will become a lot easier. Um, but yeah, we do understand that a lack of resource there can be quite challenging, particularly for SME size organisations as well. If you're kind of have the ability to do so and don't necessarily have time, it is worth looking at the consultant led options as well, as they can take a little bit of the load off of your plate. Um, it's just dependent on your kind of finances there as well. So we can see as well, some of the other key ones are kind of so having to submit to multiple flat platforms such as CDP, EcoVardis and we're seeing a lot more of this as we move towards put people pushing on their supply chain. So um, this is overall a positive movement, but we are seeing that little bit of a teething problem there where as someone who has to submit to them, if you're being asked to submit to three, four, five different platforms, it can be quite challenging and time consuming for you. Our hope is that as we move forward, companies will align these a little bit better and so you won't have to kind of tailor these so much for each individual submission again with the platforms um, it is worth when you're looking at these if you haven't got one already and it's something that interests you looking at what the outputs of the platforms are can that platform uh, support you by producing a report specifically for your needs. Uh, if you need to do a CDP submission, can it produce you your results in that format? So it makes that process very easy for you. Um, and as I say, hopefully we'll see those align a little bit more in future and we can see that they already are getting there at the moment with SPTI and CDP being quite closely tied now as well. Um, a good number of you have said that you don't feel there have been any major challenges on measuring your footprint data, which is actually really great news to see. Uh, not quite what I expected, but positive news nonetheless. Um, and a few of you also there saying that you don't know where to start. So hopefully this has given you a little bit more insight into how you can really start your, your journey here. Um, really being with the measurement to enable you to set a reasonable target there. On the challenges for production and, and net zero journey, um, a lot of you are saying it's very similar. You're not sure where to start with that. Um, as I say, hopefully some of that has been cleared up and maybe some of those questions will come through on the panel discussion shortly. But um, really, once you've got your base year set up and it's kind of appropriate for your organization covering the scape that you need it to cover to set uh, reasonable targets, then it really is just about looking at what you can do next um, and taking into consideration those passive movements around you as well. The grid moving to renewable, for example, and the uh, kind of ban on sale of new petrol and diesel vehicles there too. Um, which we'll see in kind of 2035 time. Uh, some of you are also saying here the lack of resource and time, so similar to the measurement of your footprint. Um, and again, this is something that we hope will kind of ease up in future as we move towards uh, more software based platforms for measurement that will give you more time and resource to be able to look at the active reductions there. Um, it is worth considering a carbon reduction plan if you don't already have one in place. And you can use this to make sure that you are setting aside time to check in at least once a year, but ideally um, as a minimum every six months and setting those targets um, with timelines in mind and allocating specific kind of responsible people for those to make sure that the work is spread out as much as it can be. Um, other significant challenges, you've mentioned getting suppliers on board. Uh, again, this is something that we do hear quite often. Really, it's a, a good thing to kind of explain to them why you're asking for the information that you're asking for. And uh, some people and organisations can get a little bit flustered sometimes if you're suddenly asking them lots of questions about what they do and how they do it. Um, so giving them that context of why and how it would help you is, is really useful, we find, for that. And it's also worth looking at 
um, when your contracts renew with them and getting these uh, things written into the contract. So you can actually kind of mandate within the contract that they provide you with the information that you need um, to measure your footprint as accurately as possible. And they show you any plans that they have to reach net zero or kind of reduce their own emissions as well. So that's worth looking at. And you can you can add that into a procurement policy going forwards too for any new suppliers. That will be most of the things from me actually. Um, and I'll pass back to you, Wendy. Thank you so much, Zoe. I think it's worth mentioning that we do have a lot of free resources right here on um, on the sustainable business network. I'm, I'm going to just share my screen a second. I've got to slightly reorganize things, please bear with. Um, all of the videos from past sessions. So when we're talking about, I'm going to call it climate change target setting to get away from science based. I, I just personally, I don't like it because it should be everything's got to be analytical, it's got to be quantitative. So it just is a funny title. I know why we've got there. But anyway, how to do uh, climate change target setting. We have the uh, papers online for you to view. And um, if you go to the SBN uh, videos page, you'll see that. So it's a good place to pick up um, things there. I'll just try and share that with you for a moment so you can look at that. And I think Joel will put the link there in the chat. So um, you can see all of the recent talks that we've done. So you'll be able to pick up target setting and how to do supply chain. It is tricky getting people on board. And um, there are some easier ways if you do a spend based analysis to get a sense of the size of your um, of your supply chain footprint. And obviously, once you've done that, then you're in a position to target those big areas of footprint contribution. Um, there we go. Let's have a look. Do we have any more questions at the moment? Um, I had here on just through through email was um, is the is the um, ISO's got the guideline on net zero. Are we expecting this to follow very soon as a full ISO following on from fourteen thousand sixty eight? Um, Zoe, what do we know about timings for that? We don't have a set timeline on this yet, but we have kind of uh heard on the bsi kind of yep. grapevine that it will likely be within the next kind of two years ideally one year mm -hmm. um but those things are not kind of set in stone yet um mm -hmm. but it is something that we should see in the future mm -hmm. and i think it's something we do encourage because um with the isos okay there could be a little charge to download the document with the methodologies but once you've got that then it's yours there is no further spend. A criticism of other methods are that um, organisations like SBTI obviously set up and need to need to pay their staff, and so they need you to pay money to them to do things. Whereas, from my perspective, I think that should be free. Um, I understand why it's not, but um, there we go. Whereas with the ISO. Once you've got the document, you can you can run with that. You don't have to get it externally audited. You can just align with it. So you're minimizing your spend for all of you SMEs out there. Obviously, you don't have that amount of budget to be able to do this. So to be able to get a document with a methodology and to align with it would be um, so much better. And that was just an observation from one of our one of our attendees there. OK, we have right. a question in the chat. Right. OK, uh, I've, we've got Phil we online asking the... what is meant by claiming carbon neutral plus? Um, so carbon neutral plus, you might see different variations of this from different organisations. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, it's taking that kind of carbon neutral and going above and beyond. So mm -hmm. that may include um, reducing by offsetting or using the um, other methods mm -hmm. such as afforestation to make positive changes. So it can be a little bit of a confusing term. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of neutrals and pluses and negatives mm -hmm. thrown around in these um, terminologies, mm -hmm. which is where a lot of the confusion comes mm -hmm. from. But yeah, ultimately that is 
typically speaking, uh, making that positive contribution to the environment uh, in addition to your reductions and offsetting. I think it's a fair point you've made there because um, with um, carbon neutral and what we have in 14,068, that is a really good international global definition now. Um, but as Zoe points out there, if you've neutralised, you've only levelled up you don't have any net positive effect on funding climate change solutions just by doing that. You've just levelled. Wouldn't it be better to go above and beyond that? So that that's really what that's aiming at. Um, is it quantified too, too much at the moment? Maybe not as much as it uh, should be. And um, probably just to mention here, one of the criticisms of something like the VCMI, not to be confused with ICVCM, um, is that their labels allowed you to make a claim below 100% offset, which in my mind, I don't understand because you haven't done enough even to level up. So with the carbon, carbon neutral plus, you have leveled and you've gone above and beyond, which is a positive thing to do. Great, I think we've got, uh, here we go. Great. OK, Matthew is just asking to re-explain in a nutshell. This is your elevator pitch. Here you go, Zoe. In less than a minute, what is the difference between carbon neutral and net zero? Yeah, so obviously we covered this uh, throughout the presentation, but just a quick summary for you, because I know it can be confusing. Um, Net zero typically is used to describe a journey where you are setting a long term target. So 2050 is a, a prime example, and you're reducing your emissions along that pathway to get to what they deem as residual, which is those emissions that you you can't really uh, reduce any further for technical uh, and economic feasibility reasons. Uh, and once you get there, you're offsetting um, in some form those residual emissions, and that will be something that you can claim once you've hit that in the long term. So you'd be looking at, at potentially waiting till 2050 or, or a similar marker there before you can really claim that. Carbon neutral, uh, the key difference, particularly when we look at the ISO, is then looking at a similar long term journey, but enabling you to actually claim carbon neutral along the pathway to getting to that end point. And you can do that by reducing and offsetting your emissions along the way. Uh, hopefully that clarifies that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. it, it's really good to have these definitions now cast in stone because I think there has been some confusion in times gone by. It, it's worth mentioning um, that um, Mark Carney and the activity around ICVCM came about because without the voluntary carbon market, we won't hit the net zero targets. We can't decarbonize quickly enough for that to happen. So it isn't one rather than the other. They do really go hand in hand. It is important. Obviously, you understand which ones you're using. And if you are on that journey to net zero, the carbon neutrality year on year must have those reductions in place as well. Um, and then obviously net zero will ha happen faster. So it isn't a case of, yes, we'll keep going with our own internal reductions. And then we'll do this final bit at the end because we're not going to decarbonize as um, you know globally fast enough for that to happen. So that's really where that's come about. Great. Okay. Right. Question about oh, this is specific to the oil and gas industry about uh, guidelines on uh, setting the reduction targets in um, you know, quite a, an intensive industry. Um, it's a good question, particularly because if I'm being critical, I'd say that the targets that they have for everyone else are pretty generic. Um, pretty much, well, do do 50 percent by. 2030 and do 90% by 2050 is pretty much where it's at. Um, so we, do we know any specifics about industries? I'm not sure if we can comment on the oil and gas, but I know there are different different um, guidelines on specific sectors. Yeah, so there are a number of different um, specific sector guidance pieces. Uh, looking at the oil and gas 
specifically uh they haven't actually released it yet but it is in development still so they are currently asking for expert opinion so if that is something that's relevant to you please feel free to pop onto their website um because they are as i say taking uh application for that now um hopefully we will see this uh in the next year come into light to really move those industries forward obviously as wendy mentioned there the the corporate standard is, is quite generic and covers most corporate businesses um but we really do need to see this guidance come into play for these kind of more specific sectors there as we have seen with uh, the flag emissions um and finance sector for example mm -hmm. great thank you so much zoe and uh, we are running a few minutes behind so we will take any further questions at the end in the the panel discussion i'm now delighted to hand over to Peter Sharman and Sean Robinson from Mulally. Yeah, Wendy, thank you very much for giving Sean and I the opportunity and the Sustainable Business Network as well. Um, so I'm Peter Sharman, Director of Sustainability and Corporate Governance at Mulally, and I'm joined by my colleague Sean Robinson, who's our Sustainability and Environmental Officer. Let's click on to the next slide, Sean. We're going to take you through our, our journey for striving to net zero. And Zoe, that was a fantastic presentation. Um, and hopefully what we're going to do here is we're going to provide you we can sort of walk the talk, as it were, and take you through our journey as to where we're at in, in terms of striving for net zero. So Malali are a family owned construction company. This is what this is one of our sites. A little bit about us on the next slide, Sean. Uh, so we've we've been in existence for over 50 years. As I say, we're, we're, fam we're privately owned family business uh, run by the Amali family. Our offices are in Essex. Uh, this is one of our construction projects uh, next to the Emirates Stadium, which is a decarbonisation project, which is oh, <laughs> all in the news as, as well from a construction point of view. Um, yeah, we've, we've got a 100, 190 million turnover, 500, uh, approximately 500 staff in general, and we operate largely across uh, London and the South East. And I think the next slide shows that, Sean. Yeah, so we operate predominantly within the M25. We do stretch into the North and the South home, home counties. And next one, Sean. So, Speaking to Wendy just before this event, I did a, a very similar talk to the Sustainable Business Network in person five years ago and took you through the story. At that point in time, that was at the outset of ESOS and SECA and 50,001. I know we've spoken a lot about the new ISOs with regard to carbon neutrality. Our initial focus was based very, very much on measuring and collecting, collecting data and getting to our first set of data where we could get our first carbon footprint report. And you'll see there, the first one we got was in February 2014. And we had 1,678 emissions. I can't overemphasize the points that Zoe has made with regard to predominantly the main aim is to reduce your emissions. The first and foremost objective for all of us is to primarily reduce our emissions. And we'll take you through, when I hand over to Sean, he'll take you through a number of examples of how we've dealt with this practically. Um, and for a construction company, clearly there are some challenges, not least of which scope three. But aside from aside from looking at the broader agenda, and, and I'm pleased that Wendy mentioned climate change, there are some commercial benefits to this as well. So it's not just about reducing emissions and hitting targets and, and reaching the Paris Agreement. There are commercial benefits in terms of reducing your expenditure on energy, uh, which we've seen as we go along. So move on, Sean. So it started off with, with ESOS for us. Uh, the, the best route for us with regard to ESOS was to go down the 50,001 route. That basis uh, ensured that reducing our energy and our carbon emissions became much more organic um, and something that we had to strive towards achieving. Um, so we set up a, an energy management system. We have a regular environmental and energy performance review group that looks at our, our carbon. There's a nice quote there. I won't read it out from, from BSI when we got our 50,001 certificate. And we were one of the first companies to, to get ESOS uh, phase one compliance. <laughs> We were also, believe it or not, we were the first companies to get ESOS phase two compliance, but we're certainly not going to be the first for phase three. Um, as far as phase three is concerned, uh, the MESOS, I don't know those of you that have been trying to get on the platform, but it took an awful long time for it to come over the line. And then it was all last minute dot com and a bit of a rush. So we hit the first target. We're in the process of going back through through MESOS to ensure compliance with ESOS phase three. Next slide, Sean. 
this is how we started a long time ago. Um, and I, I believe that Zoe mentioned some tools that will help you through. Sean will, Sean will come on and explain how we've moved into a platform base that gives a lot, much better granularity and information in terms of how we can dissect stuff. This was their original energy monitoring workbook, which is done on an Excel spreadsheet. And you'll see uh, in terms of just going through the lines, the top line is electricity. I've then got um, diesel and unleaded fuel and then gas at the end. And you see the, the, the totals as we work our way across. So what you'll see there, this, this is on the basis of energy. Energy obviously correlates back to carbon. We'll talk more about that as we go through the presentation. The biggest, ch the biggest chunk originally in terms of energy was electricity. The biggest chunk of our carbon is very much in terms of our fleet and our transport. We have a couple of um, intensity ratios. Obviously, they're going to be required for ESOS, ESOS phase three. Um, and so we, me we measure our energy and carbon on the basis of our turnover and our staff numbers, which obviously from a construction point of view do regulate and, and fluctuate. Next slide, Sean. So this was this was one of our, our, our carbon footprint reports. And you'll see that at the bottom there, that you see the measures, the measurements that I mentioned in terms of CO2 per employee and tons of CO2 per, per million pounds worth of turnover and various, various ranges. So on the left hand side, the chart that you see at the bottom left hand corner is Grey Fleet, which is a big challenge for us. And Sean will talk through some examples of how we're trying to address and reduce that. In terms of electricity, we've gone down the Rego route, which obviously reduces the intensity and the grid itself has actually managed to reduce emissions as well. The one um, the one challenge that we faced was when World's Tank came in as well, and that just bumped up our emissions, which gave us a bigger challenge. Next slide. Um, we have supported uh, offsetting, um, and in terms of offsetting, I'm, you know, I go back to what Zoe said. Predominantly, the aim is always to reduce your your consumption and your emissions. So we regularly seek to address that, but we have been offset in our, our residual emissions, and I'm pleased to say that we've been carbon neutral. Uh, for eight years now. We've offset over 11,000 tonnes, as you see down the bottom left hand corner of the slide. This is one of my favourite projects, uh, which is tree, plant, tree planting in, in Kenya. Um, obviously, we provided the T-shirts with good, good sponsorship. There's good PR associated with this as well. We genuinely don't do it for those PR reasons. Having, having said that, we do try and align and the last, one of the last slides that Zoe brought up was the different um, range of options you've got with regard to carbon offsetting. My predominant aim throughout the whole of our offsetting program has always been to um, invest in a whole range of different projects. And I've reported this to our board. Our, our CEO initially said, well, why aren't we just tree planting in Redbridge, Peter? Why are we not just tree planting in Redbridge? It's because climate change is universal. And so what we try and do with our, in, with our offsetting projects is every year, I use a range of projects. So it's not just wind and solar, it might be cook stoves, it might be peat restoration, it might be um, reducing carbon, hydroelectric power. We've done a whole raft of them. And each time we do them, we try and align them to our preferred sustainable development goals. And also we try and cover different continents as well to show the breadth and depth and the importance of reducing climate uh, reducing our impact on, the, on, on climate change going forward. Next slide, Sean. This, was, uh, this is one of our, our SECA reports. Um, so in terms of, of ESOS and, and the compliance side of it, Sean will come on to talk about this. There is the mandatory, there is the mandatory reporting requirements that are required. And obviously there's a lot of disclosures that are needed now. So our first SECA report, at first my uh, FD wasn't appreciative of the fact that we needed to put a SECA report. I said we do, it's part of the financial regulations that have come through. And so our SECA report is really, this is a key document for us. We have our carbon footprint report first, so we measure, we monitor, we manage, we have our footprint report. Then we produce our SECA report on the back of that, which will incorporate any offsetting that we've done so in, to ensure that we get to our carbon neutral basis. Um, the question that came in just before Sean and I took over on, on the presentation was about um, carbon, neut carbon neutrality plus for two or three years. And Wendy will know this. We went down the route of carbon neutrality plus. In many ways, you can do that. But my aim is always just to achieve carbon neutrality by offsetting the impact and reducing the emissions that for which we're responsible for emitting um, and to reduce our, our overall. I think on um, next slide, Sean, I think I pass over to Sean now in yeah. terms. Of, so that's a rapid tour in terms of how we've got to where we are now. Sean will now take you through and give you some practical examples of how hopefully you can uh, continue the journey in, in terms of striving for net zero. Sean, over to you. Can everyone hear me? Yep, I can hear you, mate. OK, great. Yeah, so um, thanks, Peter. So I'm Sean, I'm the Sustainability Environmental Officer. Um, I've been at Milani for two years now. 
And uh, Peter's kind of been through the journey of how we first started measuring our energy consumption and then our carbon footprint and try and reduce this down and then offsetting this and becoming carbon neutral, um, which is great. Um, but we see net zero as kind of the next stage as uh, being carbon neutral is fantastic, but you can, <clears throat> you can actually offset as much emissions as you, as you want if you've got deep enough pockets. So net zero really helps you hold yourself to account over the long term. So why do we want to do this? So there's a few main drivers as to why we, we want, why we, why we want to become net zero. And um, so initially there is the compliance side of things. So some of you may have heard of the public procurement notice 06, which was released in 2021. And this stipulates that if you're bidding for public contracts, which most of our clients are in the public sector, you must have a carbon reduction plan and you must be um, reducing, reducing this year on year. So that's the compliance side of it. And then obviously there's the, it's client driven. Um, so we won't skirt around that issue. Um, so a lot of our clients are in the public sector and they have their own net zero pledges, their own net zero strategies. So at bid stage, um, sometimes they may ask us, okay, so when have you pledged to become net zero? Um, have you got your own net zero strategy in place? And so that is obviously a big driver is if we want to win those contracts, then we need to be seeing that we're, we're doing something ourselves. Um, and then having uh, mids and long-term targets is really useful as you can kind of measure your own, your own performance against that and have a kind of a goal um, yeah, in, in 30, 30 or so years time and that you're aiming for to kind of reduce your emissions down to a residual level. And then obviously the main thing is that it's the right thing to be doing and we want to be decarbonizing our operation, uh, decarbonizing our operations as much as possible as individuals, as a company, um, and as an industry, the construction industry is one of the most polluting. It's responsible for about 40% of emissions uh, uh, worldwide. And so if we're taking this seriously and want to avoid a catastrophic climate change and meet the Paris Climate, Paris climate Agreement uh, by reducing carbon emissions and uh, global temperatures to 1.5 degrees, um, then, yeah, we need to have, take some bold action. So how do we do this? So uh, as Peter probably mentioned, um, we the first thing was to measure uh, data. So from different facets of a company, there's some of them are quite carbon intensive. And so we need to gather data in this and uh, make sure we're across it. So firstly, there's the electricity, gas and gas consumption. So this comes from all our different construction sites across London and the Southeast. Um, it also comes, comes from facilities. So we have a number of warehouses um, satellite offices and then our head office, which is actually the most um, en energy intensive part of our business. Um, there's also fuel uh, consumed by our fleet uh, and then also employee commuting. So we do a survey on um, how far people travel in, by what means uh, and how often. And uh, using this information, we're able to calculate um, the amount of carbon emissions that come from employee commuting. And there's also uh, business travel, so people claim against uh, claim money for the amount of miles that they drive. And so we use this, there's fuel cards as well. And then there's the diesel used by uh, plant and machinery on site. So we have diesel generators and different um, sorts of machinery on site. And um, so those records are sent to me. And um, yeah, and then they're all put into one big spreadsheet at the moment. Um, so this is the energy monitoring workbook. Uh, Peter talked to, talked to talked to you about this before. So it's a kind of gargantuan, massive spreadsheet that's been gathering data for 10 plus years now. Um, and yeah, so because it was so big, there was a few issues with it. And so sometimes it would kind of glitch and we didn't really know why. And there's lots of different pivot tables. And sometimes they wouldn't work as well as we thought, but it did its job uh, for, for the time that we had it. And as you can see here, we're able to analyze um, the kilowatt hours that we've been consuming over time. Uh, we're able to kind of look at the kilowatt hours over turnover and then see where our energy consumption comes from. So in 2023, um, you can see that 55% of our, of our um, energy consumption was from electricity. I want you to keep, keep that in mind as I'm going to show you something later. So um, because the, this spreadsheet was so glitchy and um, quite hard to manage, we were looking for an alternative that was um, yeah, just a lot easier um, and hopefully online so that we, don't ha we didn't have to kind of uh, deal with kind of Excel. Um, and so we've transitioned to Sustrax, which is an online platform where you can, um, so basically what, what I had to do was transfer all the data from this energy monitoring workbook and put it into Sustrax, which is an online platform. 
So as you can see on the left hand side, it, it splits into fuel, electricity, cars and so on. And um, yeah, so I transferred that all in there. Uh, there was various bits of evidence that I had to add. And then using Sustrax, it, um, it, instead of it coming up in kilowatt hours, as I'll show you next, it comes up in, um, it comes straight away up in tons of carbon dioxide, which is a lot easier for us, but you can also have it in kilowatt hours, which is useful for us in terms of ESOS, which will also come to you later. So this is our electricity consumption, and you can see it analyzes it straight away, and you can see that obviously the consumption is slightly higher um, in November, December, January, um, in the winter months, as you'd expect, because people are turning the lights on, electric heaters, things like that. Um, and then just go going into another one of the, the main um, facets of our business that's carbon intensive is the is cars. So similarly, um, I added all the data that I had um, from the Energy Warranty Workbook into here. And then from now on, now that it's all in there, month by month, I can just um, add those bits of information I get from the various bits at uh, the various parts of the company, um, add it into Sustrax, and then it does all the analysis for me. Um, so we're really pleased with it at the moment. Um, it's, yeah, so there's been some initial teething issues in terms of um, some problems that I, um, I faced because it's quite a new program, but um, I spoke to the team and they sorted them out straight away. And so, yeah, I'm uh, really happy with it so far. Uh, and then, yeah, so, so you add in the data into the different sections and then there's also um, a analysis function. So this, I've just shown you one um, to show our progress over time, but you can split it up into uh, where the emissions are coming from, what category, you can um, add tags and maybe split it up into different divisions of your company. But this is just the, um, our, our, the scopes and over the years. So you can see that in 2020, and that was kind of COVID years. So um, our, because we had a lot less, lot less activity, our carbon emissions were a bit further down. Uh, and then it rose in 2021, um, slightly down in 2022. And then um, luckily we've, we've managed to um, reduce our emissions quite a bit in the last reporting year, 2023, so that's 2024. Uh, and also you can see that the majority of our emissions, as it comes from employee commuting, uh, business travel, um, are scope three at the moment. But there's a lot more, uh, as aspects of scope three that we can be um, putting data into as well. So this is our carbon reduction plan. Um, so this is kind of to align with PPN06. Um, so we started this in 2021, but in the last reporting year, we really kind of had a focus on improving it and looking at areas that we can uh, reduce our carbon emissions and, and yeah, just presenting it a lot better. So um, here's the, the, so basically, we have our baseline, even though we've been collecting data since um, 12, 2012, um, the, the quality of 2013, sorry, the quality of the data wasn't good enough and the scope wasn't large enough uh, initially. So our baseline year is 2016, and that was uh, 2067.03 uh, tonnes of emissions. Uh, and then we set out some targets. So the first benchmark year was 2020, and we wanted a 20% reduction. Then we've actually set another, a second one, which is in 2026. We wanted a 50% reduction by then. Um, and yeah, we're, we're achieving this at the moment. Um, yeah, so we're kind of ahead of schedule, but I'll show you that in the next slide. And yeah, just wanted to show you this pie chart here. So earlier I, I showed you that our, um, from our kilowatt hours, the highest consumption was from electricity. Because, because of some of the measures that we've put into place, you can see that electricity is only 6% of the carbon emissions. So the emissions reduction target, so yeah, as I said, that we wanted a 20% um, reduction by 2020 and then a 50% reduction by uh, 2026. So um, here's the uh, 2026 target uh, and, here, yeah, here's, and, and I've kind of worked out where we should be by 2022 and you can see that we're, we're well ahead of target. Um, and then, so we've just had, we've just submitted all our data through Sustrax and we've just had our first second report through Sustrax. Uh, for our 2023 and 2024 emissions. So I've done my, um, without um, doing the next carbon reduction plan as that'll happen in the next couple of months, I've done my own analysis here and show where we are compared to where we should be. And yeah, we're, we're well ahead of target. I think we're already below our 2026 target. So that leads me to think that um, as we have a long way from 2026 to 2050, that there should really be uh, an, another additional target and maybe we should be more ambitious for this one as we seem to be kind of um, quite far ahead. 
So uh, some of the reasons of, uh, and how we've been able to reduce our carbon emissions is that so for all the electricity that we consume on our sites, facilities and the head office and our other satellite offices, we've switched over to Rego, uh, electric, Rego certified electricity. So this basically means that it's from a, a purely renewable source. I, I did this through um, British Gas. Um, and yeah, you can pay a little bit of extra, you pay a premium for it, but it means that it's come from a purely renewable source. So, so far, as some of the contracts were in longer term, we have 93% of our contracts that are purely renewable, and we hope to have um, 100% in the next kind of year or so once those other contracts run out. And that's, yeah, that's made a big difference, especially this. So this happened in uh, November 2022. So in our last reporting year, 2023, 20, 24, it's made a big difference. And that's why there's been, that's why I think there's been the, um, the reduction between 22, 23 and 23, 24. Um, so we've also reduced our fleet size. Um, so we, we have a lot, a lot less vehicles as, yeah, they weren't really necessary for our operations. Uh, we're also trying to, um, convince people to kind of move over to hybrid and electric vehicles for their own cars and also transitioning to hybrid electric vehicles for what uh, what's left of our, of our fleet. So um, at head office, we've put um, we've installed 10 different um, EV charging points. And um, this was a, a few years ago now, I think Peter, uh, this is before my time actually, but Peter uh, helped install these. And I think initially there wasn't much take up as people didn't really have uh, electric vehicles and obviously the infrastructure around the rest of the country probably wasn't as good but now that's improved and electric vehicles are becoming cheaper um, yeah more and more people and the fact that they can charge their car for free at work it's encouraged more and more people to to get electric vehicles or hybrids and now people are fighting over the space and you know people are having to switch in and out at lunchtime and yeah so they're oversubscribed at the moment but yeah that's trying to encourage people to yeah, have electric vehicles to reduce our um, grey fleet emissions. Um, but then, so that's kind of reducing the emissions, but there's also quite a lot of embodied carbon related to electric vehicles. So um, how to cut them out completely? Um, that would be by yeah, cutting, em uh, em cutting employee commuting emissions by encouraging things like active travel. So as I mentioned earlier, um, I do an employee travel survey where I get everyone to tell me how far they drive in, by what, by what means and how often. And then I'm able to uh, calculate the amount of carbon emissions that's attributed to, um, to this facet of our business. Um, and I'm also able to get some statistics which we're able to use to target specific measures. So I found out that when I did the last one, 72% of um, our employees travelled in by single occupancy vehicles. Um, a lot of people live really close to each other but, and were just travelling in by single occupancy vehicles, you know, even yeah, in the same town. So um, a lot of people live quite close to the office. I think about 45% were within a 10k radius. So um, some targeted measures that we've introduced are the bike to work scheme, which has been widely adopted um, and lots more people are cycling. We've also provided uh, bike shelters and showering facilities at head office. And we have that on a lot of our sites as well, just to try and encourage people to cycle in and not, and not uh, drive. And there's also the car sharing scheme. So um, this has been adopted by, um, by a few different groups in different towns where people we, um, yeah, share the rides and that um, consolidates the amount of emissions and reduces the amount of traffic. And also obviously active travel and, you know, is good for your health and, and, and makes you feel good when you, when you, when you attempt to work in the morning. Um, and yeah, so that's um, cutting employee emissions. Then there's behavioural change. So um, I do lots of different campaigns. I have a quarterly environmental newsletter where I'm raising the environmental agenda. I'm promoting um, the reduction in carbon emissions through employee behaviours. So there's, they also do a lot of um, work on energy efficiency. So it's both focusing on the head office in terms of switching off lights, printing, commuting, um, yeah, turning off laptops and monitors, which is another campaign we're running at the moment as lots of people uh, at the end of the day, you know, leave their laptops and, and uh, computers on. So, um, yeah, we're doing a specific targeted campaign about that at the moment. And then obviously on the construction sites, um, yeah, I do. I go around and do audits 
of these sites and make sure that they're performing well environmentally, but I'm also making sure that they have their energy efficiency measures in place, that they have insulated cabins, they have PIR, PIR sensors, things aren't being turned on, that people are being um, efficient with the amount of diesel that they're using, that they're not idling um, plant and machinery. And, you know, because construction is such a high impact in business, especially on the construction sites, every little change does make a big reduction. So, um, yeah, and then another example of, of as one of the campaigns, it was Bike to Work Week, I think last week, the week before, so we did big, a big kind of uh, campaign around that and getting pictures, people to send them, send pictures of themselves in and, and uh, encourage people to cycle in and reinforce that we've got a Bike to Work scheme. So yeah, please use it, especially while the weather's nice. Um, so yeah, ESOS phase three. So uh, I've got to put this GIF up because uh, yeah, me and Peter have had some issues in terms of, well, number one, it was delayed uh, because of the technical issues. And then we've also had our own technical issues in terms of, so there's a two or three step uh, verification process. And Peter is the main uh, person on our Vsauce platform. And unfortunately we were locked out of that. Um, so we, I think we've just about uh, managed to get access again. So we've missed the initial deadline, even though we're kind of pretty much ready. Um, but yeah, so in the next kind of week or so, we're going to um, get that submitted. Um, we've got to August now, so that's fine. But um, it's kind of concurrent with uh, our, our drive for net zero as because um, in this new ESOS phase three, a really positive thing is that you have to create action plans and then stick to them. And so this is going to be really useful for me and Peter when, so for example, Theresa Gevin House is our head office and it's the most energy intensive of all our different sites. And there's quite a few different energy efficiency measures that we've um, proposed in the past, but we haven't, um, have, we haven't got over the line. Whereas when we've, um, when we've got a, a specific energy reduction plan um, that's, that we have to meet, and we know exactly how much um, how, uh, the reduction in energy that we're going to be consuming. Um, it will really hopefully help us help us convince the board and, enc and encourage us to get um, get get those uh, measures over the line. So that includes kind of better insulating the uh, the building, um, putting in more energy efficient energy efficient and energy efficient lighting, and so on. So the big elephant in the room, which I haven't mentioned yet, is scope three emissions. And um, so we're measuring parts of our scope three emissions, like the welter tank and the employee commuting and the business travel. But there's some aspects um, which just suspects is really helpful for in terms of maybe waste um, that we, we're not including. But the big one for a construction company, as you may already know, is purchase goods and services, as a lot of the um, goods and services, or especially the materials that we're buying, can be quite um, energy, uh, sorry, carbon intensive. And um, so at the moment, I'm at the initial stage where I've worked with the accounts department and I've got the top 20 suppliers from each different department. Yeah, we've got three different uh, purchasing is their own thing. And so I've got the top 20 from all of them and I've gone through, I'll just show you the next stage. I've gone through and I've made a big spreadsheet about um, where, uh, so how much we're spending, and then I'm doing a spend rest approach and, and applying emissions factors um, depending on their SIT code. Uh, and then I'm able to, so I'm in the process of doing this. And then I've also had a look at each of their websites and done some research about where they are themselves. Some of them are, uh, are really far ahead and they've got the got net zero targets, got a carbon reduction plan, some of them not so much. And then from this, I'm going to start. Um, getting in contact with these suppliers, um, giving them some advice, asking or asking the specific questions and then getting some more granular detail from them if they've got their own carbon reduction plans. And then hopefully cascading influence down the supply chain so that it's, you know, so we, we've been influenced by our, um, by our clients because they've asked us to have a carbon reduction plan and that's kind of kick-started us in this movement and we're kind of hoping to do the same further down the supply chain. Hopefully that goes further down and further down. So as a unit, as, um, cumulatively, will make a, a, a bigger impact. Um, and then, so, so to display all this is CADI. Um, so that's the Carbon Database Initiative. And that's basically just kind of full disclosure, being completely transparent about the emissions that we've, that we've produced over the last few years or since we started. Uh, and then people are able to compare us to maybe other contractors or we're able to look for suppliers ourselves and see, OK, right, so they've got a carbon reduction plan in place and they're making better progress than the others. 
Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of, so we've submitted all our information onto Caddy, which is completely free to use. And so, yeah, so that's what we've done. And then, yeah, so just as a summary, um, so yeah, we started our journey over 12 years ago. Um, so we've been, we worked to improve our data set so that it um, encompassed um, all the different facets of our business that are carbon intensive. We achieved our baseline in 2016. Uh, then using this, we've had annual carbon footprint footprint reports that calculate um, our carbon footprint and then track progress against this, um, giving us recommendations. And then we've implemented some of these recommendations. We've come up with some of our own initiatives that's helped uh, reduce our emissions year on year and then offsetting these, re um, these emissions to become carbon neutral. And the stage that we're kind of going for now is to strive for net zero. So we're building on this well, yeah, so we're building on the carbon neutrality, um, so we're always looking for ways to uh, reduce our operational emissions uh, and working to drive down emissions through the supply chain by spreading our inference and then through procurement decisions as well. Um, and yeah, that's all, that's all that we have for you. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions, then yeah, please, please raise them. Thanks, Sean. Well done. Thank you so much to Peter and Sean for um, fascinating. Oh gosh, we've got we have a lot of questions here. I'm super conscious at the time. Um, I think some of the questions actually, as we've gone through, they have been answered, and we're going to roll. I think into the um, what's left of the poll. Great. I think I think what I'm going to do here. Let, let's open this up a little bit and have a a chat about um, making a good green claim. I know that we're all really super vigilant. No one wants to make a bad claim. Everyone wants to be able to tell the world what they're doing and the responsible things. So I think um, there are probably a, a couple of perspectives on this. And um, the first would be making sure that your claim is completely solid. So just to ask the panel here of, um, what would you recommend there of making sure that what you're saying is absolutely spot on? Um, I might go to Zoe actually first on this one. Yep, so um, one of the, a great way to, to look at this, um, obviously you can look at the SBN uh, that Wendy popped in the chat as well, but um, is to follow the Competition and Markets Authority mm -hmm. guidance on making a good claim. Um, so I'll pop a link for that in the chat mm -hmm. just so that you can take a look. Um, but a lot of this comes down to really being transparent uh, and honest in what you're what you're saying. As, as we've kind of covered today, there are a lot of uh, kind of keywords and, and jargon, if you like, um, around uh, carbon neutral, net zero, climate positive. Um, and really, you know, any claim that you make, you should be able to back up. So if you kind of uh, make your claims, then have a have a really transparent and clear uh, kind of sustainability page on your web page, for example, um, that, that really shows people how you've got to, to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Pete, Pete, just come in, sure. Wendy. I mean, what all, are your go-tos in terms of the ISOs, really, and things? I know there, um, I, I, I think your words rather than mine, I know that you're very keen that any way you measure anything that you say has an ISO or has something that's equivalent to that associated with it. Is that for me, Wendy? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. All, all of all of our data is, is verified. I see the questions coming through. I mean, in in terms of you know more recently, what Sean was saying about putting everything into Sustrax, we provide evidence of all of our um, electricity consumptions. We take meter readings, we put them into the chart, but we provide the, the the backup, all of the utility invoices with all of the with all of the fuel card data. We provide all of the shell card reports, so those that have got those that have got fuel cards. All of the data is there and then that's all independently verified. Mm -hmm. All of the, any offsetting program we do as well is also verified through gold standard um, and other, other means. And so I think in terms of you know transparency and disclosure is very good, but ensuring that you've got accurate data. I mean, BSI mm -hmm. come in and do audits. Well, Sean and I have got an audit next month with BSI for two days for our 50,001. Um, I like to stick with BSI because I think they are very they are very thorough. They are forensic. There's no stone unturned with regard to the work that they do. And so we get that into verif verification through a number of different means. Hopefully that helps. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. I think to take the other perspective, what do we do? What is the recourse if we spot one of our competitors who's um, claiming a bit too much? And I think sometimes having seen this happen in 
from um, some companies. I don't think they set out necessarily to do it. I think sometimes it can happen because the messages get a bit scrambled. There's an external PR agency who gets a bit um, enthusiastic about it and the messages get lost. Um, that's one thing I think. And I'm going to go back to Zoe in just a second that if you did want to whistleblow, I think you can approach the CMA and they will investigate. Um, Zoe, can you comment on that? Yeah, I think that is the case. Um, you should be able to, I've popped the link in the chat for the, their site as well. So you should be able to see that on there in a little bit more detail. But um, yeah, I think they are investigating any any kind of whistleblowing claims. Um, it's worth noting there as well, just going back to the ISO quickly, um, I did see in the chat a comment about uh, green claims on, particularly within kind of the clothing, clothing industry. Um, the ISO for carbon neutrality, does cover products as well so it's not just organizational emissions so that might be something that uh, is worth looking into uh, to make sure that your own claims are as good as they can be very good very good great okay um what shall we take next just uh very aware of the time here i think the scope three question got answered we also have, um, yeah, a sort of rationale's comments on um, target setting, really, um, and how you went about yours for uh, P Peter and Sean. How do you go about your target a, setting? A lot, a lot of our targets, to be honest with you, are sort of commercially driven as well in mm -hmm. terms of the money that we can save. Because, you know, you think back in the day when we first mm -hmm. when we did our first footprint, we were spending well over a million pounds. And, and so the argument that I make to the board when we're setting the targets that get verified by the board is looking at how we can save money. You know, I mean, we, we've cut out if we've cut our expenditure on energy by by um let's say, say 50 percent, which we're pretty much on, on course for doing. If you turn that into that, you know, that's that's money off the bottom line. And if you were to look at trying to make that it sounds I'm sorry, it sounds a very commercial answer rather than the correct sort of climate change answer on SBTI driven. But the reality is, if you were to look at how much how much additional turnover we'd have to make to make that level of profit and it, so it makes us much more efficient. But in so saying that by reducing the cost, we're reducing the energy, we're reducing, we're reducing the emissions. You know, so it, it's all one. It's all one of the same as far as I'm concerned. So we set ourselves some targets. We set ourselves. We have KPIs on on, on every single year. So every year, I think we had the um, four percent reduction on energy. It used to be five percent reduction um, going through. And so it has to be. We have to stretch ourselves with regard to that. And Sean's already said we're now going to looking at the figures and how we're what we're performing at the moment. We're probably going to have to increase our targets. 2050 might, might come down to 2040. In terms of greenwash, I see some other construction companies who won't be named that say they're going to be net zero by 2030. Rubbish. Not a chance. You know, don't give me that. So we do try. We do try and act fairly and reasonably. And obviously, this goes through. Apart from the independent verification organisations, such as whether it be BSI, Carbon Footprint, whoever, um, it goes through our board process as well. And our board are very keen on monitoring and what we say and what we say is what we do. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that it is very important to have a degree of integrity with regard to this. Hopefully that helps. Great, great. Thank you. And I think just leading on from that, we did obviously mention almost in dispatches what's going on with ESOS. We are looking forward now to ESOS phase four, and it, it looks as though that that is going to have some degree of net zero in it. We don't know quite what. So I think there are a number of questions that are coming along the chat there that might get covered effectively by how ESOS transitions from being the once every four years to action plans, I think every year now, and folding in net zero and possibly the SECR as well. Um, so I think we're going to see some of that. Are, are we going to re be required to have everything externally audited as well? Some comments around that. Um, not sure yet. Would it be a good idea to have it checked? Yes, I think because some of this is quite new, quite new thinking. J just um, any views from um, Zoe, Peter, Sean about uh, what that might end up looking like? Sean, Zoe, do you have a view? Um, touching on the, I guess, the ESOS phase four 
uh, parts there. Um, we are expecting to see a movement more into kind of looking at carbon alongside the energy. Obviously, it's been very energy uh, heavy in the past. Um, and as you say, Peter, they, they do kind of go hand in hand in, in a lot of cases. There are some niche examples where they might differ slightly, but generally speaking, for most businesses, those are going to look quite similar. Um, we are essentially what we're seeing here with the movement towards the kind of energy action plans as well is very similar to what we have seen in the past with the PAS 2060 kind of annual carbon reduction plans, um, obviously sitting slightly separately there from the BSI itself, but essentially that's what we're seeing coming into the, the ESOS kind of trajectory there. So that's uh, really positive to see. Um, a lot of companies obviously kind of do have the uh, four year plan in their head for ESOS and it all kind of comes to a head at the four year mark. Um, and, you know, SECA does support this now and, and provides a kind of annual method of looking at this. But these annual plans will really help people moving forward um, to kind of spread the load across the four years rather than, than getting to the end and having to do it all at once. Yeah, I think, interesting. I think you'll be a yeah, welcome transition as, um, as you said already, the energy and carbon and carbon emissions are really, really linked. And so um, having a more kind of carbon focused ESOS will kind of run concurrently with a net zero plans. And so kind of killing two birds with one stone there. Um, so, yeah, I think it'll be a welcome, um, welcome addition. Great, great. I realise we're a few minutes over. I'm just going to share my screen again. Um, if I can ask Sean and Peter, there are a couple of specific questions, I think, for Mulally in the chat. If you could res if, just to keep timings here, if you could please respond to those in the chat, that would be much appreciated. Yeah, sure. And I will just to wrap up for today. Please do scan the code. Joel's going to put the, the long code in the chat there, so you've got that. Please do fill that in. Tell us what you felt about today. Tell us what you'd like to see on the next sessions, and if you'd like to speak at them, it really does make a difference. I'm now going to do a shameless plug for the next Sustainable Business Network session, which is live and in person at the University of Winchester. I really do encourage you to come along to this. Um, the team over there with uh, Matt, Jane at the helm are do a fan doing a fantastic job. They've got all sorts of technologies there that they would love to show you. We've al also got sessions on how to fund your renewables and lo low carbon tech. Please do scan away at that QR code and I'm sure we'll be sending you a mailer about that as well. That's going to be quite early on um, in the morning on the 8th of July, but we will be providing breakfast. So there's an incentive for coming along. So please do check that out. If you want some more SBN in the meantime, this is the um, our page with the uh, library on it. There's over 20 sessions on here now. Please do go check it, um, that out. A number of those sessions, I think, are in the, in the links here today. And it's bringing things to a conclusion today to say a huge thank you to all our speakers, Zoe, Peter, Sean. Thank you for your fantastic presentations today. Also, a huge thanks to the three councils, being Hart, Basingstoke and Rushmore, for your kind support of these sessions. And also, finally, thank you to you for an excellent number of uh, questions and taking part in the poll. We hope you have a lovely weekend and we look forward to seeing you on the next SBN. Thank you very much. <laughs>